I would like to welcome everybody for the last time today. Um, it is May 8, 2020, and um, this is Center for Inquiry Victoria Branch monthly talk. And today's topic is the House of Prayers report of BC Humanists, and um, it will be discussed and explored in detail by the author of the report, Dr. Bandarov himself. Hello, Dr. Bandarov. Hi, how's it going? Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you. And oh, first, I would like to give a brief bio about Dr. Bandarov. Um, he lives in uh, Sanich area with his partner, and he's a community, community organizer for over 15 years. Um, and he's very active in Sanich municipal politics. And he's a volunteer member of the board of the Greater Victoria Placemaking Network. And uh, he has ha set, have setting up dozens of uh, free libraries across the region. And he also works as a debate coach, a coaching speech and debate across Vancouver Island. He has a PhD in politics and international studies from the University of Cambridge and two bachelor BAs from the University of Calgary, political science and international relations. He runs his own research consultancy, The Ideal Tree, where he conducts issue research for environmental organizations. Uh, he's a world expert in fish crime and the strategic use of international law by nine state actors. And he identifies himself as a proud new Democrat and president of the Sanich Gulf Island and BP Riding Association. A dedicated environmentalist, Dr. Bandar founded Oceans Sea, a marine conversation, uh, conservation organization dedicated to combating illegal fishing and wildlife crime. So um, welcome again, and uh, thank you uh, for uh, being here today. And yes, we will be listening to you for the um, next hour or two. And whenever you like to um, give a break or start having the questions, just feel free to uh, moderate as well. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah, thank you, everybody, and welcome. Uh, I think it will be really uh, go well if people add questions in the uh, text as we go along, um, because if we have any um, misunderstandings or things that people would like me to talk about, um, it's better if we cover them at the time. I'm going to cover a lot of material, and it'll be a lot of work backtracking at the end. So if you have a pressing question, please ask it. Um, just want a couple other things to add um, to Oner's comment. Uh, it's Dr. Phelps Bonderoff, so it's a weird double last name. And um, in addition to all those other things, I'm also the chair and co-founder of Access BC, which is a provincial campaign for free prescription contraception here in BC. And um, I've added a lot of my contact information in the chat. So you're welcome to email me at hello at teal.ca. You can see a lot of my collected publications and projects at my website. Um, and you're also welcome to tweet at me at, at tealpb. Um, before I get going, um, I'm here on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen people. Um, it's a land which is, um, has an historical relationship um, by the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Masonic peoples, and, and that relationship continues to this day. And the plan for today's talk is to cover a lot of material. So I'm going to start with a, an overview of prayer in the BC legislature. I'm then going to do a survey of legislative prayer across the country, because I know we have some people here joining us from around Canada. Um, I'll talk a bit more about a brief history of legislative prayer, quite brief, don't worry. <laughs> I'll talk a bit more about the Saguenay decision, which is a landmark Supreme Court decision relating specifically to legislative prayer. Um, and then I'm gonna explore some of the arguments you're likely to encounter both for and against legislative prayer and show why the arguments against legislative prayer are overwhelmingly, um, are overwhelming, which is of course why the uh, Supreme Court agreed. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about our study in more detail. Um, we did a comprehensive study of prayer in the BC legislature over the past uh, many years since 2003. And then um, I'll talk about the results, our analysis, some discussion, some of our recommendations, and I'll end by talking about some of the ongoing work that the BC Humanists um, are conducting that I'm coordinating, looking into um, legislative prayer across the country at, at different levels of government. I have to, before I get going into the content, have to thank my co-authors on this report. 
You can find the full report on the link um, included in the chat, or if you search House of Prayers Study um, PC Humanists, you will find it. It's a very large report, and we put it together on really short notice. Um, so my co-authors were Ian Bushfield, um, who actually had a child during the editing process, like quite literally a couple days before we were uh, presenting the report, <laughs> he had a child. Um, Dr. Katie Marshall, who's um, a zoologist from the University of British Columbia, and our two summer researchers, Ranil Prasad and Noah Lawrence. Um, we also had a team of 50 volunteers working on the data collection um, and transcription for the project. So it was a huge effort um, by people all across the country, um, and it was really fun to be part of a team. So a bit of background about the project itself. Um, I'm a political scientist, I love government, I love politics, and I was visiting the legislature here in British Columbia a while back to watch the proceedings and noticed that it started with a prayer. Now I already knew that it started with a prayer, but it really kind of came home to me when I had to sit there and, and watch a prayer begin a session. And so at this point I then approached um, Ian at the BC Humanists and we launched a study. This was two years ago. Basically the background of prayer in the BC legislature then. So Standing Order 25 establishes that daily sessions, the routine business of the day begins with a prayer. On average, these are about 89 words long, and the speaker invites a member of the legislature or MLA to lead us in prayer. So it's very much one MLA leading the group in prayer. There are two options for MLAs. They can, um, they can do one, read one of five sample prayers, or they can read a prayer of their own devising. Um, and the question was, what is the House of Prayer? Um, in this case, this is the BC legislature. So here in British Columbia, um, we're unicameral, so we have a single house, it's the BC legislature. Good question, yeah. Um, and the House of, the title of the paper is just us being clever <laughs> as best we can. <laughs> um, in addition to MLAs delivering prayers, um, the throne speech is preceded by a prayer. Um, this is typically delivered by a member of the public and they're invited by um, the government speaker and they're typically a representative of faith groups, um, as well as um, some First Nations elders have also delivered those prayers. So when we are looking at prayer in the BC legislature, the first thing to know is that it's not hansardized, which is a fun vocab word for those of you who are not political geeks like me. Hansardized means to transcribe the contents of the legislature into a written form. Everything else that's said in the BC legislature is transcribed, but not prayers. And um, they weren't available uh, on video or audio until, or video rather until 2003 in October. So before this date, we had no idea what was being said for the prayers. But from that date, we have video recordings of them. So in other words, um, we had to sort of look at the prayers and um, before we could even begin studying them, we had to transcribe them. And I'll talk a bit more about that process in a bit. The other thing is, um, the process about who delivers the prayers, which MLA gets to deliver them, it's kind of opaque to us. It's internal workings of the house with the house leaders and parties and caucus whips deciding who delivers the prayer. And we're really not quite sure how that works, but we have a bit of an idea um, given our results. And I'll talk about that in a little while. The only other thing worth mentioning about BC in particular is that we have exciting news, sort of. Um, in November, 2019, the BC legislature changed their rules about legislative prayer. Um, we, we hope that we had a bit of an influence on this, um, and they changed them from prayers to prayers and reflections. So it's not exactly the, the greatest change. It still has lots of problems, which I will be exploring shortly, but um, it was a bit of a change, and it does show that the legislature is open to change. The reason we released the report um, that you see linked in the, in the comments on um, the House of Prayers report um, so quickly was we were speaking to the clerk um, of, the, of the House, um, and she mentioned at this point the acting clerk and she mentioned that the office of the speaker was collecting information and, and soliciting responses from the public and from various stakeholder groups and faith groups about changing the sample prayers and about changing the process around prayer so we rushed our report out in order to make it part of that consultation process so i know there's people from around the country um, and so moving from bc we can look at the practice across the country and there's a lot of diversity it's it's quite different so for example, British Columbia, as I said, MLAs deliver a prayer of their own devising, or they may read one off a list. Two other places do that, Nunavut and Northwest Territories. And in those jurisdictions, they sometimes also inc include drumming. The Lord's Prayer is used to open the uh, legislatures of New Brunswick, PEI, and Ontario. And since 2008, the uh, legislature of Ontario has also included a, a second prayer that's delivered 
and they have a rotating list that includes indigenous, Buddhist, Baha'i, Muslim, Jewish, and Sikh prayers. So they have two prayers. One is the Lord's Prayer, and one is a secondary prayer that's read off of a rota. Nova Scotia has a shortened version of the Lord's Prayer written by this, a former speaker. It's basically the same thing, but shorter. Alberta has the practice where the speaker delivers a prayer and they write the prayer themselves. The previous speaker before the change of government um, used to deliver different prayers every day. The current speaker reads the same prayer that's read in the United Kingdom uh, Parliament. Saskatchewan and Manitoba um, have a non-denominational prayer read by the speaker. I'm using air quotes there for those just listening, um, and I will speak about why <laughs> a little later on. Uh, the Yukon has um, one of four standard prayers, and they are read before the broadcast begins. So we don't actually know the content of them without uh, taking a wonderful trip to the Yukon, which, believe me, I would love to do as field work. Um, Quebec used to start with prayer, but in 1976, they abolished the practice, and they now have time for reflection. And Newfoundland and Labrador has never started their sessions with a prayer. So that's a general overview of Canada. Um, the Senate and the House of Commons start with a prayer read by the speaker, um, and it's followed by a time for a reflection. Again, this is air quotes, non-denominational. You can look it up. Um, it's linked in our report and on the um, House and Senate um, websites. It is very much overtly a, a non-denominational prayer, but it is still a prayer. Legislative prayer at the federal level um, and uh, subsequently as a result at the provincial levels um, kind of finds its origin in 1558, where Queen Elizabeth I um, created the process. It was typically started by the speaker in the United Kingdom, and, and in 1659, it was delivered by an official chaplain. Um, any questions at this point? Because I, 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 it's a lot of information. I'm going to be try hopefully filling your, uh, your minds with lots of information. If at any point you need more detailed analysis or citations, they're all very well um, included in our, in our study. And I'm kind of following the format of our report, so you could follow along at home if you prefer sort of more written content as well. So yeah, um, in comparison to other countries, um, there's lots of different practices. I'm looking at other sort of Westminster models of government. The United Kingdom begins its sessions with a prayer, but it's delivered before the public enters. And, um, and this reflects the sort of private nature of prayer. So prayer is delivered, then the public is allowed in the gallery. In the United States, it gets even more interesting, as I'm sure you know, our, our friends in the South have some issues with separation of religion and government as well. Um, there they have official paid chaplains for each of their um, houses of government. And um, these have always been Christian, they have always been male. And um, they are able to invite other members of religions in to, um, to deliver prayers. Um, they're also very well paid. Uh, these chaplains in 2018, the American Senate chaplain was paid $172,500. And um, so, you know, it's quite a lot of it's good money, I suppose, um, for doing uh, work that typically involves coordinating the invitation of other people to deliver prayer. Um, there's a question here. Um, legislatures are covered by parliamentary privilege, correct? I will definitely cover parliamentary privilege. Um, they might be, but the question um, we'll explore is whether it applies in this case. Um, and that is a, a great live issue. Thank you for your question, Tony. I promise to get to it. And if I don't, please remind me. Um, and the other question there is how many legislatures still retain religious symbols? Um, I have not done a survey of that, so I, I couldn't answer the question. I don't know. Um, it would be a very interesting study to do, um, but I don't know the answer. Actually, I might make a note of that. That's a good question. <laughs> um, field trip to all the legislatures. I can geek out. Okay, so um, moving on, and please do keep the questions coming. Um, with respect to legislative prayer in Canada, this is not a new controversy. Uh, people have had concerns about this for a long time. In 1969, um, Elmer Sofa, an MPP from Ontario, objected to the practice. In 2008, uh, Premier Dalton McGuinty in Ontario, uh, or Dalton McGuinty proposed changing it. Um, Nova Scotia in 2001, there was a controversy to try and change the practice. Um, our friends at the Centre for Inquiry in Regina have been pushing for this issue um, in 2016 and 2018. Um, a lot of respect to them for, for pushing that issue as well. Um, and some green MLAs in New Brunswick also pushed the issue in 2019. And this is, this is an ongoing question, and where we see the strongest content and strongest decisions by courts on this matter is at the municipal level. So I'll talk really briefly about the Saguenay decision, um, and this, is, this covers sort of really important jurisprudence on the issue of separation of religion and government in Canada. Basically, the Saguenay decision is um, 2015, and Alain Simoneau, um, a resident in um, Saguenay in Quebec, objected to the fact that his municipal councils were being started by a prayer led by the mayor um, who guided the members of the council along. Um, just following up on Tony's question, there was also a question of 
um, votive candles and a large cross um, on the walls of the municipal council as well, but that issue was not necessarily addressed by the court decision um, in a way that's constructive to our conversation. Um, in this decision, though, um, Justice Gascon stated that the state has a duty of religious neutrality. The state can neither favor nor hinder any particular belief or non-belief, um, and that this was a democratic imperative. So it, it, the, the decision in Saguenay really sussed out this evolving constitutional um, uh, separation of religion and government in Canada and really codified it in a very strict way. And I want to read directly from that decision for a second because it's very powerful and impactful for what it says. It says, the state may not act in such a way as to create preferential public space that favors certain religious groups and is hostile to others. It follows that the state may not, by expressing its own religious preference, promote the participation of believers to the exclusion of non-believers or vice versa. So basically, you can't start a municipal council with prayer, and if you do, you violate the Constitution, you undermine democracy, you exclude and discriminate against people, and you violate the state's duty of religious neutrality. So now we were talking before people came on, if your municipal council starts with prayer, they are breaking the law and they need to stop. Any questions about Saguenay before we press on? It's a great decision. I recommend everyone who is passionate about separation of religion and government issues, um, read it in full. Um, and it, there's some really rich content there. Um, and it does talk a bit about um, parliamentary privilege, which I'll talk to in a minute. Um, so seeing none, I'll, I'll just press on here. So basically, when it comes to legislative prayer, and a lot of these arguments are captured in the Saguenay decision, there are some concerns. And the first comes from a religious perspective. For someone who is religious, legislative prayer trivializes the sacred act. So if you're a religious person, prayer is is a communication with your deity, with your a divine, with the universe, something that's very sacred to you. Having it delivered in a political context is not appropriate in that context. And we actually found this with respect to MLAs smuggling in partisan content into their prayers. Um, one of my favorites was Norton Letnick, uh, 2000, uh, October 19th, 2011. He wrote, we pray to, or sorry, he, he, he said, we pray to God to keep us mindful of the special and unique opportunity we have to work for our constituents in our province. And we thank the people of Canada for the shipbuilding contract. Uh, you know, that's, uh, that's not exactly what I would say, um, respecting the sanctity of prayer in any sense. Um, my other favorite one, and I'm going to look this one up on my other list here, was uh, an MLA decided to use the opportunity to, um, of delivering a prayer to threaten unions. Um, and uh, so basically, um, he, where, what was it there? I think it's here. Yeah, here we go. So this is during the HEU um, Health Workers Union strike, and um, Kevin Kruger, MLA for Kamloops North Thompson, um, in 2004, said the following. This is an excerpt. Um, and we pray for the HEU members who want to who want back to work that you'll help them carefully appraise their their opportunities and make choices that will be the right ones for themselves and their families. Um, taking an opportunity to deliver a prayer to threaten uh, union workers probably not respecting prayer as a thing that's sacred to religious people. So that's one of the concerns. Um, and you can actually see the private nature of prayer reflected in other legislatures. So for example, as I mentioned earlier, the United Kingdom excludes members of the public when they do the prayer. And that is to reflect the sort of sacred nature of it. Um, and you can actually see this reflected in the Bible. You weren't expecting a Bible study here coming from a CFI talk, but Matthew 6, 5 says, and when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the street, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, that they will have their reward. I mean, there's another threat hidden in there as well. So um, maybe, um, maybe some prayers can be threats. Um, but generally speaking, prayers, and there's a really good reason for separation of religion and government, and there's a religious reason for that. I did see a question pop up here. Let's just see what we have here. So the question was, how many... Um, municipal governments are still using prayer. I'm really glad you asked that question, Kendra. Um, the link uh, that I posted earlier, and actually I'll post it again now, um, is actually to an ongoing project that the BC Humanists are conducting to answer that exact question. Um, no one has done a study of it yet. We did a study here in British Columbia. There are 162 municipalities, and we found at least 22 of them, I think 23, um, were violating the constitution by starting with prayer. So we anticipate of the 3,700 municipalities across the country um, that some of them are also still breaking the law. And I know one of our um, folks here in the chat was mentioning that their municipality is. Um, so if you're interested in helping with that program, please sign up. Um, you get assigned five municipalities to look at, and we're gonna create a larger report 
um, and it's going to really help answer that question because we don't have the data on it. Um, and the question was, does any legislature engage in indigenous religious prayers or observances? Fantastic question. The answer is um, not in an official capacity. However, in the Northwest Territories and Yukon, as I mentioned earlier, um, it is up to the MLA to deliver whatever kind of uh, prayer that they would like. And so just skimming through some of their Hansard videos, I did notice that some of them will give um, Indigenous content, whether it's religious or not, um, is, is a sort of a, a broader question. And likewise, there will be some drumming as well. So that was the biggest example we saw. Um, British Columbia doesn't start with the territorial acknowledgement, um, although there was one very recently um, when the House was sitting during COVID. And uh, we actually, the BC Humanists have a, report, a full report coming out on that. So I'd encourage you to read through that um, for more information. And I think actually I posted that link to Jonathan and not to the group. So let me just share that link to everybody. This is the uh, how to sign up for the municipal prayer study. Right, so another argument that's often brought up uh, against uh, municipal prayer is that it promotes one denomination over others. And you can see how this happens. You know, people have been fighting religious wars over tiny aspects of dogma and tiny differences of words um, in their religions for a very long time. And so even selecting one word over another, Heavenly Father versus uh, Lord, um, could cause strife and indicates a denomination preference. And so anytime you try to have a non-denominational prayer, you will fail because it is impossible to develop a prayer that is so nuanced that it captures the views of all different religions, even within the same kind of broader category, say Christianity or Islam. And you can even have just differences about kinds of prayers. So for example, if anyone really delves into this, um, here's a question, right? You have petitionary prayer. So petitionary prayer is the act of asking a God for something. And there's considerable debate within theology about whether you can actually do this, right? If someone's religion perceives um, God, a God's plan to be set in stone or God's views to be unchanging, asking that God for something or to change their mind is kind of not okay. Right? You're kind of questioning the views of that God. These are live issues and, and questions in theology. And as soon as you select a prayer that either thanks God for something or, thanks, uh, or asks a God to do something, you are entering into that theological debate. You're necessarily taking sides. You're picking one deity over another, one aspect of religion over another, and that is a huge problem when the state has to be neutral on issues of, of, of dogma. Um, and literally, like, we're not kidding, wars have been fought over this stuff, right? <laughs> um, and so this is, not, this is why we have separation of religion and government. The other aspect is that this will necessarily put one religion over another, right? So, for example, as I mentioned earlier, municipality uh, legislatures across the country start with the Lord's Prayer, many of them. That is the prayer of one specific religious denomination, not others. And you can make a prayer as ecumenical as possible, but even a prayer to a monotheistic vague God, air quotes again, is going to ignore polytheists or religions that are non-theistic. So religions that may have a philosophical bent. I don't know if some of you saw the decision in um, the Church of Atheism case that recently came out before the Supreme Court, but that case recognized that Canadian definitions of religion don't really cover the question of uh, religions that don't have a God as such. Uh, things like Buddhism or, or broader philosophical uh, sets of, of religious views. So if you start a prayer with Heavenly Father or generic God, you are still excluding some religions that do not have a conception of a God. But we can go even further because some religions cannot have their prayers delivered in the legislature. It will necessarily exclude them. So for example, some prayers must be delivered in sanctified space. They must be delivered with a correct mindset, it must be delivered with the correct person, with the correct number of people, the correct clothing, facing the right direction, the right hygiene standards. So for example, without a minyan, you could never have an Orthodox Jewish prayer delivered in the BC legislature. The fact that there are potentially menstruating women present means you couldn't have some prayers delivered by some religious sects. And so these groups will necessarily be excluded because their religion cannot be represented in the space that is the legislature. And finally, I'm sure you were expecting this, but it also, definitely excludes non-believers, right? So no matter how inclusive you are to capture all the vast diversity of religious views from Ekankar to Satanism, to Buddhism, to Catholicism, you are still excluding non-believers. And again, the Supreme Court has said that this violates the duty of religious neutrality. It is not okay to do this, whether religious neutrality is deciding between religions, but also deciding between the religious and the non-religious. So this is critical. And one thing to reinforce here too is that this is not the same as going to your friend's choir practice or choir uh, presentation at a church. 
right? This is a workplace. It is an open public space that should be welcoming to all British Columbians or all Canadians or all people from around the world for that matter. And this, again, the MLAs are invited to lead us in prayer, which implies state endorsement or group sentiment. So again, this is not okay from a separation of religion and government perspective. It presumes universality of belief, and it's the same as classroom prayer in that context, but magnified because it's our seat of government. So for some of you who might be interested in pursuing these issues, you're likely to encounter a couple of arguments defending legislative prayer. I wanted to canvas these really briefly because they're kind of interesting and they kind of um, help frame the strength of the arguments in, against legislative prayer. Hmm. So the first one is the God of the preamble. So you'll often encounter the argument that the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms starts with, whereas Canada is founded upon the principles that recognize the supremacy of God. Well, Saguenay addressed this exact question. The Saguenay decision said, this is a political theory. It's got nothing to do with an assertion that Canada is a theistic state. At any time in any advocacy around separation of religion and government, if you ever encounter this argument, it is a terrible argument. The preambulatory clauses cannot take precedence over operative clauses. I don't care if you're at the United Nations, if you're uh, writing a resolution for your local uh, Rotary Club, the fact is that the operative clauses are where the substance of a, of, a, uh, of a resolution of a policy is, and the Supreme Court has agreed with this and also said that this is referring to a broader political theory. The next argument that comes up is another classic, which is the tradition. We have a tradition of doing this. Um, for those of you who are familiar with your Latin fallacies, this is the ad antiquatum fallacy. Uh, there are a lot of parliamentary traditions that are terrible. So for example, we have a tradition of excluding women, people of Chinese and Japanese descent, Dukabors, First Nations people, even members of the clergy were not allowed to hold office in British Columbia. These are traditions that we've had. They're not good traditions. So the fact that something is old does not make it good, does not justify it as a practice because we can change. Um, if we were to extend this argument um, as, at a reductio kind of approach, we would go back to the traditions that excluded almost everybody, but sort of landowning men um, from being members of, of the legislature, let alone delivering prayer. And there's a lot of secular traditions that the legislatures have that are great, that help reinforce that the tradition has a role, right? So for example, here in British Columbia, our speaker wears a really cool tri-corner hat. There's a mace, there's ceremony, people carry the mace in, there's books. These things are secular symbols that we can have that all people can share rather than excluding certain groups. Another argument that often comes up is that it's just a good thing to do. And now, I don't need to deal with this argument very much, but this kind of betrays a massive bias towards religious sentiment. Um, and so like, no, it's not, <laughs> is a good response, or that's one person's view, but not everyone agrees. Another argument, and this is actually one of the biggest impetus um, motivators for us studying this, is the question of whether or not legislative prayer promotes diversity. So when we started off this project, we emailed MLAs and asked them what their opinion was. We didn't get a lot of responses. Um, fair enough, they're busy folks and we're not their constituents. But the ones that did respond, the ones who supported legislative prayer would say that, no, no, we see legislative prayer as an opportunity to promote diversity of British Columbian beliefs. Now, without a study of all the prayer in BC legislature, we didn't know if it did actually reflect the diversity of beliefs. So by studying this, we were able to counter or to engage with that argument and say, ah, yes, it does reflect the diversity or no, it does not. And I think you may have a bit of a spoiler alert, but as we go through the results, we will find that no, unfortunately, legislative prayer in British Columbia does not reflect the diversity of the public. But not only that, this still violates Saguenay, right? The state, uh, the neutrality of public space helps preserve and promote multicultural, the multicultural nature of Canada. This is direct wording from uh, the, the, the Saguenay decision. So Saguenay says, no, the exact opposite. Creating a neutral public space is the best way to promote diversity. And we're not saying that MLAs can't wear religious headgear or have their own personal religious beliefs or start the session by doing prayer with a couple of friends in, in a different room. But what we're saying is that you're not promoting diversity when you exclude people from the legislature. There is a question here and I wanna just, uh, I'll just read through here. Uh, one counselor told me um, it was each counselor's charter right to read a prayer. He told me that he didn't read or didn't understand the Saguenay decision. And of course, um, this is in relation to the municipality. Brilliant, okay, yes, that's the next, um, I have exact point in this, wait for point seven. I'll get to that in point seven, I promise, because it's coming up. Um, actually, no, I'm gonna skip to that right now because it's totally topical. The answer is no, it's not the same, right? 
an MLA acting in an official is acting in an official capacity. So in your example, Tony, a city councilor is acting in an official capacity. It's not their personal right. They are acting um, on behalf of the state, in this case, the municipal government. And so we can't say that we're infringing upon their right. Just like teachers don't have the right to proselytize to students. Um, so it does not hold that um, councillors or MLAs or members of parliament have a right in this context to use the edifice of the state to promote their religion. That's a critical point in Saguenay. Um, and the councillor you're talking about is very wrong and we can help write a letter if need be. Um, because, and this comes up a lot though, you see this argument of people's rights are being trounced. We're not saying you can't pray. We're saying you can't steal the power of the state to promote your religion. And, and that's kind of a critical as aspect. The thing I underline here is that MLAs are acting in performance of their functions. They are doing their job and they have to represent all British Columbians, or in this case, all folks from your, municipal your municipality. Uh, two other last arguments that come up, and I'm, I'm sorry you encountered that argument, Tony, because one would hope councillors would simply follow the law, but we can set them right, no problem. The last two arguments that come up a lot are um, that legislative prayer is seen as solemnizing an occasion, right? This idea of pomp and circumstance. There are lots of secular ways of solemnizing an occasion. Um, and so it's better to have an occasion that's solemnized by reinforcing our rights, by including all people. You wouldn't say that this occasion is solemn then kick out all the women or kick out anyone with a certain skin tone. That would be unacceptable. Um, so in a sense, you, if to solemnize an occasion, um, there are better ways and secular ways to do this. Um, for those who are interested in some of the philosophy behind this, the United States has a different approach. In the United States, they've found that legislative prayer is okay because it's a form of what's called ceremonial deism. This was not accepted by the Canadian courts. Um, and if you're interested in taking a deep dive on that, please do ask me, but it's a broader question. In a sense, in the United States, their version of ceremonial deism is an off-brand, no-name brand religion that sort of satisfies nobody and disappoints everybody. Um, so that's kind of a classic example of we're gonna try and make everybody happy with a prayer that solves no one's desires, uh, just because you cannot have a non-denominational prayer. And then the final argument is different philosophies around what is state neutrality, right? And so some people will say, oh, no, 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 state neutrality is giving everybody an opportunity to deliver prayers before the legislature, not just maybe one group, all groups. Saganay says, no, that is not the case. Um, they put it to rest. They said that true neutrality presupposes abstention. And the best way to, to, to draw an example here is, and this was used in the Saganay decision, that abolishing prayer doesn't discriminate against believers. Discriminating against believers would be starting every session of the legislature with an affirmation that there was no God. Simply not taking a position on something does not discriminate against people. Um, they're not, they're, they we're taking away a, a privilege that they shouldn't have. That is not discrimination, it's, it's leveling the playing field. Um, this is a critical example because it's, it's, it really harbor, it boils down to the Canadian conception of what true neutrality is. Um, and it is, it is a presupposition of abstention, um, and that is not discriminatory. Um, and so you might also encounter those arguments as well, Tony, um, if, you're, if you're dealing with your municipality. And the question that was asked earlier is parliamentary privilege. And I love this question. This is a live question. It has yet to be tested before the courts. Um, Saguenay and a couple of other decisions have intentionally set aside parliamentary privilege um, for the sake of discussing prayer in municipalities. Um, for those who aren't familiar, parliamentary privilege is what allows MLAs um, or MPs to not be sued for libel and defamation for things that are said in the House. Um, they, they can say what they want in the House, and this is often why you'll have um, elected officials say things like, repeat that outside of the House, where things are then justiciable. Um, parliamentary privilege is mentioned in Saguenay, um, and basically Saguenay sort of sidesteps it and says, well, we, we think it could apply, and we also think that prayer at the federal level is in a different context, therefore we're not going to explore it. Um, but, um, well, you have this other example too. The, the Ontario Human Rights Commission um, looked at the Lord's Prayer and they said that it was, it was immune from examination by their commission. Um, and exclusively that in the context of parliamentary privilege, only the houses themselves could adjudicate the internal workings of the house. However, an objection um, to the BC Human Rights Commission decision basically said that like, no, 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 this undermines the dignity and integrity of our legislature. And here's why. Um, because you're excluding the full participation of individuals from a specific group. So the question that really was brought up by one judge was, if you had a rule that said, under the parliamentary procedures, that a member of a certain sex, gender, race, sexual orientation, or religion wasn't allowed to talk at a meeting, 
that would not be okay. It wouldn't be covered under parliamentary privilege. If there was a sign outside of parliament that said only men can speak, that wouldn't be covered by parliamentary privilege because parliamentary privilege only protects the sort of the general functioning of the house and it can't undermine the dignity, integrity, and efficiency of the legislature. And excluding a group of people like, for example, women would do just that. Similarly, excluding a bunch of people, non-believers and people from non-majoritarian religions does the same thing. So I think that if this was tested out um, in the courts post Saguenay, you might get a different result. And it's definitely something that should be explored um, because it, it's not acceptable that our higher levels of, of uh, whether federal or provincial legislatures start with prayer. They still discriminate. They still violate the state's duty of religious neutrality. So that's kind of my, my preamble, <laughs> um, exploring the whole diversity of, of issues around Canada. I'm gonna get into the report now, but any questions about that preamble um, before we get onto the, the content of our study? Excellent, I was doing the old teacher pause there. So please feel free to type in some questions if you have any, um, and I'm happy to address them. And, and also if you have questions that you think of later, get in touch. Um, a lot of the more detailed information about this is in the report. Okay, so the study itself, like I said, one of the driving questions that we had was, does legislative prayer favor one religion over others? Does it promote theistic beliefs over non-theistic beliefs? Does it pr promote the religious over non-religious beliefs? Is it you know, full of partisan content? And how accurately does it reflect the diversity of the province? So there was one previous study done on this subject uh, from 2017, published in the uh, Canadian Review of Parliamentary Affairs. Um, we've submitted a, a version of the report there as well. Um, and this looked at throne prayers from 2000, 1992 to 2016. Throne prayers were transcribed because they're delivered by a guest. Um, and so this group was able to simply look at the throne prayers. They also record the person delivering them. So it's much easier to identify the religion. And um, they found that 67.7% were Christian, 12.9% were non-denominational, 9.7% were indigenous, 6.5% were Jewish, 3.2% were Muslim. Um, this does not reflect the diversity of the province at this time, wherein in British Columbia, about 44.6% of British Columbians are identified as Christian. This is from the 2011 household survey. 44.1% uh, of British Columbians identified as not having it of, of none. Um, next is uh, Sikhs, 4.7, uh, Buddhists, 2.1, and so on. So there was definitely a lack, um, the, the previous literature, the previous study on this subject identified uh, a disparity between the views of British Columbians and the prayers delivered before throne speeches. But we wanted to look at every, uh, every prayer. The bigger your sample size, the more robust your findings. And so we set about looking at every single prayer delivered in the BC legislature from October 2003 on. We had to do this, we would have gone back further if I had my way, um, but uh, in 1970, Hansard started doing limited reporting. In 1972, they started doing full reporting for budgets. In 1991, they did broadcasts. And in 2003, they had webcasts. And so we only have the webcast archives going back to 2003. Um, all the rest of the prayers before that are lost in time. Again, as I mentioned, the prayers are not Hansardized or transcribed, that is. So we recruited 52 volunteers who then transcribed 877 prayers. So this is typically a bunch of BC humanists and secular and humanists from across the country um, reading a lot more prayers than I was, I'd be happy to read. Um, we also um, duplicated a bunch of the transcriptions to verify our transcriber accuracy. And we found that uh, they had a really good response rate. Only there was about 5.7% error rate when it came to transcription. So we had the content for 866 prayers. We had, um, and that includes throne prayers. Um, four of them were unavailable, so four prayers, I think the video was cut off, and we had some technical issues which were are not resolvable. We also emailed MLAs to ask them their opinion to get some more perspective on the issue. Um, I'm going to go into a bit of the data uh, coding process here. If you are interested in the details of how we coded the data, uh, we have a complete uh, copy of our coding instructions in the back of the report as an appendix. Um, and I, I apologize if I use any political science jargon. Um, if anyone has any questions about it, please let me know. I will try to avoid using it, but sometimes it's inevitable. Um, we had two coders and what coders do is they would read the prayers and they had a bunch of criteria and they would code the prayer with those, those tags. So they would read the prayer and if it said, you know, praise Jesus, are you washed in the blood? They would probably code that as a Christian prayer and use a bunch of other tags. And that allowed us to run um, analysis of the prayers afterwards. So each prayer was read by two coders who inputted their results. And anytime there was a disparity between the two coders, 
it was read by a third coder to check for intercoder reliability. So our end sample was 866 prayers delivered by MLAs and 23 prayers um, delivered before speeches from the throne. When I'm going over the numbers, when I'm talking about MLAs and specifically, the first number, 866, is the number to, to bear in mind um, because some of the, uh, we would exclude the throne prayers when we were interested in content delivered by MLAs. Any questions about, uh, about that? If you were interested in the specific coding we used uh, and the analysis, we used a bunch of analytical tools. All the computer code that we used to analyze the prayers and the results um, are included in the report as well. There's about 23 pages of it. You're welcome to use that if you wanted to replicate our results as well, or to use that to, to do a study of your own of another uh, jurisdiction. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, MLAs deliver sample prayers. Um, they have a list, they can read off a list, or they can deliver a prayer of their own devising. Um, there are five of these sample prayers. We call them standard prayers in the report, um, but we, we've updated our language to reflect the, the practice in the legislature. We found that 50% exactly of all prayers were the sample prayers. That's 434 prayers. And um, MLAs got a little creative. 32% um, of those prayers were tagged as having been altered in some way. Um, and sometimes that was a combination of two of the prayers. Um, sometimes it was starting with a prayer and rambling, um, starting with a prayer and perhaps um, adding additional content and so on. Um, and we would tag prayers only if they were changed in a significant way. Uh, one or two word differences, unless they were significant words, um, were not included. By significant word, I mean sometimes the MLAs would read the prayer, but then drop a religious term. And so we would definitely capture that because it reflects the difference in the content on how we would code the prayer in other ways. When it came to the, the overall structure of the prayers, um, we were kind of surprised to find that 91.9% .9 of all prayers delivered in the, in the legislature ended with the word amen. Um, one thing to, to note here, when I talk about prayers, they weren't all prayers. So six of them were poems, 46 were quotations, eight of them were reflections, and there were two moments of silence. But I use the word prayer you know, as I'm talking just to sort of capture the overall um, nature of what they're being asked to do. And what's really interesting is that 83.9% of content delivered that was not a prayer, so poems, quotations, et cetera, still ended in amen. So someone would go out of their way to deliver a, a secular poem, but then still end in amen. And that has implications, and I'll talk about that a little later on, about the structure that is imposed upon having time for prayer. There's a question here, um, and that is, um, was the coding used similar to analysis from other countries? Um, so good question, Farley. We did a full literature review, and we couldn't actually find any similar comparable studies. So um, I covered this, I, I surveyed this a lot in the discussion around coding. We couldn't find another comparable study, so we ended up inventing our own categories. But we did have a glossary of terms, so we have a list of words that include names of deities, that include other religious language um, and, and other details like that, uh, that we ended up building ourselves. Um, this was a little bit um, not recommended only because um, a lot of the studies would say, hey, if you're creating your own code of religiosity, don't invent your own. Um, but we couldn't find one that really fitted for the content analysis that we were interested in. Um, other studies that looked at this kind of question were from the United States. Uh, and because that country's um, religious inclinations they tended to look at things like presidential speeches and rather than coding for which religion, they coded for which section of the Bible. <laughs> um, and so we weren't really able to apply that to what we were looking at. And quite literally there are studies that find out which president, um, the favorite Bible chapter of each president, um, which I suppose is a meaningful contribution to the, uh, the literature as well, but we couldn't apply it here. But thank you, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, so just returning to the question of structure, like I said, even secular content like poems moments of silent, silence still ended in amen. And this suggests that asking someone to deliver a prayer asks them to color within the lines um, and it ha is a problem. This builds on, the, on, the, on my response to Farley's question, which was when it came to religious language, we found that 53.8% of the prayers named a deity by name. Jesus, typically Jesus, um, uh, the couple other names we have, the glossary is not coming to my mind, but a bunch of other names of gods, 53.8% um, specifically named a deity. This also made our coding easier. 65.3% um, contained religious language in general. Um, and that would be other terms that weren't names of deity, deities, but language that was explicitly associated with a religion, washed in the blood, praising, prayer, uh, faith, things like that. Um, and we were very careful, um, and we had to read through the prayers individually, 
um, because sometimes words were used in other in, in different contexts. And by this, I mean, um, there was one prayer that was, thank God for separation of church and state, delivered somewhat tongue in cheek. Um, but had we used a computer coding mechanism, that would have been flagged as a religious prayer. And that's why we had to do manual coding with two coders reading all of the prayers. Uh, and it was really just that one prayer, <laughs> but we wanted to be really rigorous in this context. We also found nine, um, nine times where the Lord's Prayer was delivered. Another really good question here. Um, when they read a poem, were the people present instructed to stand for the prayer beforehand? Um, this has implications as well. So really good question, Tony. We did have a code column in our coding section, our, our transcription section for gestures. So MLAs, um, will tip, someone will typically stand. Um, we don't have the full view of the house on the cameras. We don't often know what everyone is doing. Um, and we asked people transcribing to look at gestures. So whether the person crossed themselves or bowed their head in prayer or did a hand gesture, the problem we ran into there was there was not enough consistency between the transcribers to include that as a, as a valid data point. There was just too much difference. Um, so we ended up dropping that from the study. It is still captured in our, um, uh, another version of our data set, but we didn't look at that. Uh, but you are right, um, reading a non-religious poem, but crossing yourself or, or doing certain gestures does add religious implications. Um, we just weren't able to capture that. Uh, the coders themselves were not transcribers, so they didn't get the visual cues. And we decided to exclude that entirely. Um, but a really good question, yeah. And you're right, I think that the critical thing there is that the speaker asks the person to lead us in prayer. The person delivering the prayer typically stands, typically bows their head and then delivers the prayer. Yeah, does that answer your question? I'm just pausing for tea here, right? <laughs> we also noticed not very many poems. Um, one source of error was that because of the transcription method, we put every bit of text into a paragraph. And so sometimes if a poem was transcribed um, in sort of block text that would identify it as a poem, um, that was lost for the, the coders. Um, so we weren't able to capture all of that. So next, the big question is religiosity. How religious are the prayers? And this builds on um, the question, um, Farley's question about developing like the codes around uh, religiosity. So we developed four categories. The first was not a prayer. This captured things that were definitely not prayers. They were poems, secular quotations, or moments of silence. The second category were secular invocations. So again, these were, these were not evoking or directed towards a specific deity, the divine, the transcendent. A lot of them could still, we, we allowed for them to end in amen, but otherwise they would not include other religious language or reference to the supernatural. And so that was sort of one of our ways of, of, avoid, uh, of, of coding prayers as secular. There's still a prayer element to them, but they didn't contain religious content. Um, if you look at the, um, the report actually, and you go to the appendices, one of the appendices that we have is the, the current prayers um, the sample list of prayers. And I'll read one of those off just so you can kind of get a, a flavor for, um, for what we're talking about here. I'm just going to find the page here. Apologies. So this is on page uh, 92 of our report. And looking at some of the prayers, um, here's a good one. Number three, secular prayer. We give thanks for the bounty of our province, our people, our land, and our resources. We pledge ourselves to tend with care our heritage on behalf of all British Columbians. So a prayer like that would have been coded as secular because it doesn't include a reference to a deity or other religious language. And, and this is a good spot to ask questions because if you, um, as, as we go through these categories, uh, they, they transcend the rest of the report and they're quite, they're quite important in that context. But the next category we had is non-sectarian. And this is some, one that sometimes people have trouble with. Basically, this was a prayer that invoked the divine, but was non-denominational. And by that, I mean that it didn't have language that we could explicitly associate with one religion or another, right? And so in, in other words, um, it was definitely religious, but it mentioned something like Lord. Well, the word Lord is used by different religious denominations, right? Jewish prayer, Christian prayer, Mormon prayer, will often use the word Lord. Um, and so unless there were other indicators and other key indicator language that would help us identify the prayer, we didn't code it as belonging to that religion and it would fall into the non-sectarian category. That's not to say that these prayers are not overtly religious, they are, it's just that we were very conservative with our result, um, our, our coding, and we only coded prayers as belonging to a religion if we could definitively identify that religion. Any prayer that we couldn't fell into this category of non-sectarian. And the final category, as I've already <laughs> uh, teased, is sectarian prayers. So these are prayers that we could definitively associate with a specific religion. And when a prayer was coded as sectarian, we would also include the religion that it was that religion itself. <laughs> 
So is that everyone sort of on the same page as far as the coding of, of different levels of religiosity? So as I go forward, I am going to combine, um, when I say religious prayer, what I mean is a prayer that is either non-sectarian or sectarian. And when I say secular, I mean the, the, the second category. Um, and that's kind of important to bear in mind because um, as I mentioned, non-sectarian prayers were still overtly religious. When we looked at the results, we found that 21.7% of all the prayers were sectarian. We could identify the religion. 49.5% of the prayers were non-sectarian. They were religious prayers where we couldn't necessarily identify the religion. 27.7% of the prayers were identified as secular and 1.4% were identified as not a prayer. So in other words, 71.2% of all the prayers delivered in the BC legislature were religious in nature. When we, we uh, burrow down into the category of sectarian prayers, so prayers where we could identify the religion, um, we found that 93.1% of them, or 175, were Christian. Oh, there's a question here. Yes, so the question was non-sectarian were almost always Christian, um, just not overt. That is correct. But because we didn't want any bias um, coming into the data, um, we, we included them as a non-sectarian category. Um, it was kind of one of those dilemmas wherein it's like, look, you have language, we, we think it's Christian, it seems Christian, but we can't really justify that. And so it would be sort of irresponsible to include it in a, in a Christian category. But yeah, that's correct. So in other words, when we look at just sectarian prayers, we're looking at ones where we definitely know what the religion is and we could justify that by looking at the language. And it typically involved the name of, um, of a deity like Jesus or very overtly religious language. Um, so for example, for Christianity, things like washed in the blood or um, uh, my mind is drawing a blank for some of the other ones that we use. They're in our glossary though, uh, so fear not. Um, yeah, and so um, of the other sectarian prayers, so the 21.7% of the prayers, there were uh, four Jewish prayers, so 2.1% of that smaller category, three Muslim prayers, and a single prayer from uh, a single Gayan prayer, Buddhist prayer, and a single Hindu prayer. So overall, um, of the prayers where we could identify the religion, 91.3% of them were Christian, and the remainder, um, very small amount, 2.1% were Jewish, 1.6% Muslim. Yeah, exactly. So that's, Kermit's mentioning that Lord is generally Abrahamic. Exactly. So we couldn't necessarily differentiate the use of Lord um, between those different religions. Exactly. And um, so, but what we could, for example, if with more overt names that are more associated like Yahweh or, um, you know, uh, if someone ended their prayer with like praise be upon him, that's an expression typically associated with Muslim prayer. So that would help us in indice that that was a Muslim prayer. That's right. So we also looked at um, other content of the prayers. So we looked at First Nations and Indigenous content. Um, and this is part of just generally trying to understand um, whether First Nations folks and their views and, and, and cultures reflected in, in the prayer. And someone asked this question earlier. We found that uh, 42 prayers had a single word in an Indigenous language. It was typically actually sabak, which is a Gitsan word, sort of like be thanked. Um, we found one sentence and one uh, instance of multiple sentences in Indigenous languages. And similarly, five uh, prayers were delivered um, almost entirely in an, in an Indigenous language. Um, and these were all throne speeches. And three of them were delivered by uh, Chief Elmer George of the Songhees Nation. So in total, we found 52 prayers, including a couple of First Nations references in English. Um, so a very sort of vanishingly small amount of content. We also looked at other language content being delivered, um, and we only found one instance of more than a single word um, or expression. We didn't include amen, by the way, but we found um, four Hebrew sentences, two Arabic sentences, two sentences where we could not identify the language, one in a Chinese dialect, and one in Aramaic. Um, and those are sort of just additional content um, to sort of look at the diversity of linguistic representation in legislative prayer. Oh, uh, by the way, the Aramaic prayer would have been classified as a Jewish prayer because it was the prayer for the dead, which I was kind of surprised to learn is not in Hebrew, but in Aramaic. So um, interestingly enough, for anyone who has some Jewish background, the prayer of the dead for the dead is Aramaic. Right, so partisan content. <laughs> so we asked her, uh, we, we didn't initially look for this category, but when our transcribers were um, giving us feedback on the process, they started reporting that there were some subtle barbs and some you know, snide remarks and partisan attacks. So we added this category um, into our, our analysis. Like I said, we didn't initially plan on looking at this, but there was considerable variation here. So it was really hard to discern what was partisan content because we didn't know what was going on in the world outside of the legislature. Um, so for example, if an MLA picked a certain verse of the Bible, 
um, maybe related to a, a, a bill coming before the House. But without intimate knowledge of what was going on in the House at the time, we wouldn't know. So we only coded overt partisan content. Um, so for example, thank God for shipbuilding contracts. Um, another one would have been um, an MLA quoting Cesar Chavez's farm workers prayer. And this was when the House was debating uh, minimum wage increases that excluded farm workers. Um, one of the other aspects to note is that our coders did not have the names or partisan affiliation of the MLAs when they were of, of the prayers when they were coding them. So it, was, it made identifying the partisan content more difficult. But nonetheless, we still identified 10 prayers um, that contain partisan content. Okay, so that's the rundown of the data. Let me get to the analysis. Any questions before I do? Just listening to my neighbors outside, we do a seven o'clock patio sing-along, and so they're, they're currently uh, playing today's song. Hmm. Okay, jumping right into the analysis. So as I said before, um, all the codes that we use for the analysis um, are available um, in the appendices of our report, and they're there's a lot of them, there's like 20, 23 pages of them. So the first thing we noticed was we looked at the prayers and the number of MLAs delivering prayers. We found that uh, most MLAs deliver one prayer. So out of the 117 MLAs um, in the time studied, 30 of them delivered one prayer, three of them delivered more than 30 prayers. So we created league tables for every single legislature with the MLAs ranked based on how many prayers they had delivered. And we noticed that the number of MLAs delivering prayers has been steadily going down. Um, we also noticed the, um, that Leonard Krog, NDP MLA for Nanaimo, was at the top of every single poll. Um, he recently stepped down um, to, to become mayor of Nanaimo. And so we're really interested in running our numbers again next year to see how the content has changed now that our most prolific uh, deliverer of prayers has stepped down. Uh, but as I said before, the number of MLAs participating in delivering prayers has gone down. In the 37th Parliament, 44% of MLAs delivered prayers, whereas in the 41st Parliament, uh, only 27% did. So some people will be interested in comparing parties. I know I certainly am. It's always fascinating to look at these dynamics. And so um, the first thing to include before I go into looking at partisan um, comparison is that we excluded the Greens from comparison. Um, the BC, for those of you who are out of the province, we have three parties. We have the, the NDP, the Liberals, and the Greens, um, who currently sort of hold balance of power in a cooperation agreement. But the Greens have not um, consistently been in the legislature, and they've only delivered two prayers in the legislature. Um, and so to avoid complicating matters, we excluded them from this analysis. Um, so we noticed that the, the party of the, uh, the individual, the party did not influence the number of prayers delivered by an MLA. So that, that it was average across um, all, both parties. And there was no relationship between secular prayers and the number of prayers delivered. So we didn't have particularly virulently secular MLAs choosing or, or pushing to get their secular prayers delivered. We found that NDP MLAs were marginally more likely to deliver secular prayers than liberals, 31.4% compared to 26%, secular prayers that is. Um, for liberals, we found them significantly more likely to deliver sectarian prayers, 26% um, of the time versus 10.3% um, of the time. When it came to Indigenous language, we found that NDP MLAs were significantly more likely to include First Nations or Indigenous languages in their, in their prayers, 11.7% compared to 0.2%. So there was a significant difference there. Oh, uh, there's a question here. Will someone be tracking utterance of prayers by the new mayor of Nanaimo? Interesting. Um, I have to check our municipal records to see if they um, had prayer. What's really interesting, actually, we found with the municipalities in British Columbia is they don't do daily prayer like they did in Saguenay. They tend to restrict prayer to only the inaugural sessions. Um, and so it makes it much easier to check. Um, and the inaugural session is the one that immediately follows the election of a new council. Um, but we do not, um, I haven't checked that yet, no. But we'll check next, uh, after next election, see what happens for sure. We then looked at the sample prayers. So uh, comparing parties again, um, looking at sample prayers, and we found that um, variation in use. So liberals um, were more likely to use sample prayers, 64% versus 35% of the time. And the liberals were less likely to alter their prayers. NDP MLAs were more likely to combine prayers, particularly number four and five from the sample list um, from page, uh, uh, from the page 94 of our report, uh, that for some reason that was a very popular combination. They did that 34 times actually. Um, and NDP MLAs were more likely to alter prayers. They altered prayers 55.1% of the time 
compared to liberals, 22.5% uh, of the time. So you get some interesting differences between the parties here. Um, and one thing we're gonna be doing in the future is doing another comparison, um, running the numbers for the next legislature and comparing it with our current findings. As I mentioned, the practice has been changed from prayers to prayers and reflections. And so we're interested to see if there's a change in the content based on the name that is given to the segment. Um, there's another question here. Does uh, BC doesn't have any conservative MLAs? Um, uh, unfortunately, if you were putting parties on the political spectrum, the provincial liberal party um, would fall sort of on the conservative um, social credit and liberal spectrum. So we do actually have a conservative party, no conservative MLAs. Um, but if you were to sort of classify the provincial uh, liberal party, they would be sort of on the right of center spectrum. Um, so yeah, for those who are out of the province, it's kind of a different different content. Um, that reflects a, a, a merger of the social credit party from a little while ago with the liberals and um, that's sort of the current amalgam. But yeah, it's, they're more right of center. Um, wrapping up towards sort of the length of prayers, I know speaking of length, we're getting on in time and I promise to get to more questions um, as we get along. We're almost, almost the two thirds of the way through here. Um, with respect to prayer length and religion and party affiliation, we found that party, um, we found that liberal MLA's prayers were 2.09% longer if they were non-secular. And NDP MLA's non-secular prayers were 1.52 times longer. This is a little more complicated language, but basically religious prayers were longer. Um, so for example, when a, li a liberal MLA was delivering a sectarian or religious prayer, um, that was found to be 1.8 times, had 1.8 times more words. And when an NDP MLA was delivering a sectarian prayer, it was 1.2 times more words than other prayers. So, and it was almost identical for Christian prayers, by the way, because the sectarian and Christian categories were, were so similar. So overall, Christian prayers were 20.2% of all the prayers in the BC legislature. However, they made up 25.6% of all of the words that were delivered. So they were much longer. And um, by the way, there were 7, 70,079 words that were delivered for prayers. So some people might want to keep a tally of that, depending if people are getting paid by the word. Um, we also were interested in looking at change over time, right? Oh, there's another question here. Correlation by prayer by age of utter. Ah, fantastic question, uh, Farley. Yes, so we didn't look at that. And a couple other things we didn't look at were uh, gender of the person delivering the prayer um, and region. And so there's a lot of other um, levels of things that people can do with our data. So that's why we're making the data publicly available. So if anyone is interested in running these, these stats, they could, it would not be hard to add age of MLA and look at, um, and look at, do an analysis of that. That's a really good question. And I, I definitely encourage you to take a look at that. And I'm gonna make a note of that myself because <laughs> it's pretty cool to look at actually. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Um, there's a lot of other things that we, were, we, we, we wish we could have looked at, um, but I mean, the report's already 138 pages long. So at a certain point you have to, to pump the brakes, um, but that's a really good question, yeah. So the next question we, thing we looked at was change over time. And like I mentioned, we're interested in looking at this uh, as an, on an ongoing basis if prayer continues in the BC legislature, which it, it seems like it will for the foreseeable future. Indigenous language content has been steadily increasing over time, which is, which is really promising, but it's still very low. And as I mentioned before, it's typically one word, um, and it's especially low amongst liberal MLAs. We found that sample prayers have been declining um, over time consistently. So MLAs are typically delivering prayers of their own devising rather than relying on the pre-written prayers. And we also found that prayer length was increasing um, and that this increase was particularly noted amongst NDP MLAs. So an NDP MLA delivering a religious prayer is going to be one of the longer prayers um, statistically. Um, with respect to religiosity over time, um, we found that there's been a general decrease in the use of secular prayers by both parties and the proportion of Christian prayers has been going up. And this is the same thing with sectarian prayers, because again, those categories are so similar. So that kind of gets us to our discussion point. Um, any other good questions um, or, or bad questions um, before we move along? Great questions, by the way. I really, really appreciate the questions you guys are asking. And um, this, this is going to help inform some of our ongoing research. So I really do appreciate people's, people's thoughts. OK, so discussion. So as I said before, we found that 71.2% of the prayers delivered in the BC legislature are religious, or were, were religious. So we can compare that to the demographics of BC. We're using the 2011 uh, BC household survey. I'm annoyed that we don't have a more up-to-date census, but um, we can blame previous federal conservative governments for that. But if you look at the province of British Columbia, 44.6% of British Columbians 
identified as one sect of Christianity or another. There's lots of them. 44.1% identified as no religion, 4.7% were Sikh, 2.1% Buddhist, 1.8% Muslim, 1.1% Hindu, 0.5% Jewish, 0.8% other. When we look at the prayers in the BC legislature in toto, um, we found that 20.2% tw uh, tw were Christian, 0% were Sikh, 0.1% were Buddhist, 0.3% Muslim, 0.1% Hindu, 0.5% Jewish, and 0.1% other. So we see all religions significantly um, underrepresented, with the exception of, of Christianity, depending on how we classify the sectarian and non-sectarian prayers, and Judaism, which seems to track the general um, proportion of the population. When we look at just sectarian prayers, so where we were able to identify the religion, again, 93.1% of those were Christian, um, obviously, uh, none doesn't count here. Zero percent were Sikh, um, and all the other categories again underrepresent um, current religious groups in British Columbia. So that's a bit of a problem. Um, so, in other words, um, those who are non-believers are not are significantly underrepresented by prayer in the BC legislature. And so, we can confidently say that the, the current practice does not reflect the views and the diversity of British Columbians. Um, and as I mentioned before, even the secular prayers that were included, the small amount of secular prayers. 88.7% of those ended in amen. And so simply even removing the religious content does not mean that the prayer will not, will still reflect the views of non-believers. Um, also, I mean, this is a, room, a group of folks that are here with CFI and have links to different humanist groups. Um, I'm sure you can all appreciate that having one declaration reflecting the views of non-believers is probably as impossible as it is to create a prayer, a non-denominational prayer. So even if we allow that every single secular prayer reflected the views of non-believers in the province, they're still significantly underrepresented. And Christianity is severely overrepresented. All, the, all religious groups um, were underrepresented with the exception of Judaism, um, and there is still a paucity of indigenous content. Um, like we said, it's promising that it's increasing over time, which is good, but it's still, it's still very thin on the ground, as it were. And, and so basically, some of, like, some of the theory here is, you know, setting aside time to open a meeting with prayer reflects a specific conceptual framework. It's a tradition that adheres to, it's perceived as time for Christian prayer. And all other traditions, whether they're religious traditions or non-believers, uh, non are seen as guests in that space. And that is how the uh, inclusion of legislative prayer excludes people. So you know, when people are asked to color inside the lines, those lines are dominated by those lines are the structure established by the dominant faith, um, the faith tradition that is. And so again, that's why groups that are delivered, people that are delivering secular prayers will deliver those prayers and still end them in amen because they're still trying to adhere to the structure imposed upon them by having time for prayer. And like I said before, even the six instances of poetry, all of them ended in amen except one, which was uh, Lana Popham's uh, True Food, A Love Poem that she delivered. Um, so again, these practices definitely exclude all but Christians and particularly non-believers, but lots of groups are being excluded by the current practice. When we look at the sample prayers, and this is really interesting because the, the clerk of the house and, and the BC legislature is currently reviewing their list of sample prayers. And uh, the BC humanists were asked to submit sample prayers. Um, we did, but we also um, published a, or, or wrote a longer report explaining why that was still, un it was unconstitutional to ask us to do so. Um, and that's coming out as an article that's been submitted to a journal called Arbiters of Faith. Um, but basically, as we noted, um, when it came to sample prayers, prayers number four and prayer number two, typically uh, prayer number four was secular and prayer number two was non-sectarian. Um, they, were, they were used much more often. And so it's very interesting. So when, when, the BC humanists or other groups, other religious groups are asked to submit sample prayers. This creates a huge problem. And this is another talk for another day, by the way, because I, I can do another hour on this, but if the state has a duty of religious neutrality and two prayers are submitted by the same religion or two different religions, they don't have the ability to pick any, either of them. So the state can't choose, can't adjudicate issues of religious dogma. So if, you know, if a member here was to submit a secular prayer, um, and someone else was to, was to submit a humanist declaration, and someone else was to submit a Satanist declaration in this process, the state would have no ability to choose between them, because doing so would violate its duty of religious neutrality. So we submitted some sample prayers, but we did so under objection because the whole process itself was unconstitutional, part of a longer conversation. Uh, and I will definitely circulate that report when it comes out. It's, it's currently an under peer review at a, at a journal. And so just sort of wrapping up towards the parties, um, overall, we found that there was 
lots of differences between the parties. So for those of you who are more political science oriented, um, the New Democrat MLAs were more likely to deliver indigenous content, had fewer sectarian prayers, um, and they were more likely to change the sample prayer. Liberal MLAs were more likely to have sectarian content, um, they were more likely to be Christian, and they were more likely to use the sample prayers. Both groups were use, uh, are using the sample prayers less often, and as I mentioned before, they're becoming more religious and they're becoming longer. And fewer MLAs are participating. So we saw this as kind of an indication that MLAs are less interested in prayer. When we, when we emailed MLAs and asked them their opinion, those that responded that they didn't support legislative prayer also indicated that they had never delivered one. I mean, it's kind of one of those things where if you don't support the process, you, you wouldn't participate in it. And so this is kind of an explanation as to why we see the number of MLAs delivering prayer going down, a possible explanation. Um, so from this, basically, we were able to devise some recommendations. And I'll, I'll wrap up with this because um, it's sort of where we see the BC legislature moving forward. We have three key recommendations, and then we have four sub-recommendations that are kind of things that we can agree to because they're better than the status quo, but they're still not good. So the first one would be to abolish the practice. As, a, as I've emphasized throughout this talk, starting a legislative session with prayer, any prayer, is archaic, it's discriminatory, it's exclusionary, and it violates the state's duty of religious neutrality. We wouldn't allow this kind of discrimination for other things, gender, sexual orientation, race, so we shouldn't allow it for uh, for, 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 for belief systems. The second option we could do would be to abolish legislative prayer and replace it with a territorial acknowledgement, an Indigenous or First Nations territorial acknowledgement. Um, this would be part of an ongoing process of reconciliation. And what we recommend is if this were to be done, that the protocols and practices surrounding this practice be developed in, in close consultation with relevant Indigenous stakeholders. Um, it's not for, for, for us to say, um, yeah, that would be something that, that different First Nations groups across the province should work with the government to devise if they want to do that. As an aside, there are 198 distinct First Nations in British Columbia, 30 language groups, and 60 dialects. So you could conceivably set up some kind of rota where those groups are represented. Uh, but again, it's, it's not, for, not for us to say. That would be something that would be developed in consultation with different, different First Nations. The third option would be to do what Quebec does, simply replace it with a time for silent reflection. In this case, anyone who is um, religious could pray on their own. They could check their phone. They could play Candy Crush. They could psych themselves up for a speech. They could also just get themselves in the right headspace to legislate on behalf of British Columbians. Those would all be acceptable courses of action. Um, again, it's silent. The silence um, is, is a form of neutrality. And I do recognize that different religions have different perceptions of what silence is. So a moment of silent reflection for a Buddhist might be different for a Christian. But in this sense, you have a, a space for reflection and it does recognize that the legislature, you want to give people the time to get their head in the game, as it were. Um, again, th there's nothing problem as problematic with, with silence. Those are the ideal three recommendations. There's four other ones that are less ideal, but we propose them as well, just because sometimes it's easier to do gradual approaches. Although, um, as, as I note in other reports, um, sometimes the gradual approaches are actually more discriminatory. As I, as I mentioned earlier, any effort to distinguish between religions violates the state's duty of religious neutrality, whereas simply abolishing practices is much easier. The first option would be the Scottish model. So the devolved Scottish Parliament um, has time for reflection. This is a weekly occurrence, and they invite a speaker to deliver a statement, um, and the person reflects the balance of beliefs in Scotland as per their most recent census. So in addition to Christian prayers, Anglican invocations, Buddhist declarations, they had a humanist deliver a secular message in British Sign Language. What's interesting here is that it reflects the fact that MLAs cannot be relied upon to accurately reflect the diversity of views in the province. Um, when given the option, they tend to do prayers based on their own backgrounds, and the backgrounds of MLAs does not reflect the accurate um, demography of the province. There's some other problems with this as well. So for example, logistics. If you were to do this on a daily basis, you would necessarily be biased in favor of Victoria because um, it's just easier for people who live here to deliver those prayers. That would be a problem. And when Scotland did this, they found that they did have the views of people reflected, but they were disproportionately delivered by men. 63% of people delivering these kinds of statements in the Scottish Parliament in 2000, between 2018 and 2019 were people who identified as male. So that's an issue. Um, and there's also another issue of deciding who you would invite, right? Um, there's problems with the census and asking people what they believe, 
um, what religion they identify with, that's not the same question. Um, and similarly, other countries have um, growing and, and prospering communities of the Jedi faith. Um, and so the question would be, do we invite those folks? Do we invite our, our friends and fellows in the church, the flying spaghetti noodle monster, solidarity and, and, and under his noodley holiness, right? So those kinds of questions become problematic. And again, we see the issue of states violating their religious neutrality in trying to decide what counts as a religion and what doesn't. Another option which we proposed would be that all of the sample prayers be secular. If you're gonna have a list of sample prayers, make them secular. And again, because MLAs cannot be relied upon to consistently deliver content, um, they would be read by the speaker. So a list of revolving prayers, uh, secular invocations, asking for the prosperity of the province. Um, it's hard to write these kinds of invocations. There's still lots of problems with it, but this would solve some of the concerns about um, state neutrality. Uh, moving down the rank of, of priority of recommendations, you could add a humanist declaration to the list of, uh, of sample prayers. And um, again, this would be read a few times, maybe by MLAs. Um, we wrote up some sample prayers. I, I was gonna read one for folks here because it was, it was difficult to do actually. Um, where are they here? Apologies. Um, it, it, was, it was quite difficult to actually write sample prayers. As, as you will all know, um, humanists, non-believers don't typically rely on prayer, and so it's difficult to do those. But we wrote a couple of them. Um, one of my favorites is, there are almost certainly no gods, therefore let us commit ourselves to tackling the challenges that face our province with reason, wisdom, and empathy. What's interesting with that one is it's particularly crafted to fit the criteria of Saguenay. As I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, when I talked about Saguenay, Saguenay said that true neutrality is abstention, and that to accurately reflect the diversity of views, therefore, you can't just have secular prayers. You have to have prayers that point to the non-existence of the deity to balance things out. Um, and I think using that example also really brings to a, a point the kinds of discrimination that um, it helps people who are believers, perhaps, who might be blind to these kinds of discrimination, see that it's really a problem um, when you kind of conceptualize it that way. Um, and finally, um, as, I, as I mentioned, you can throw in a humanist declaration into the mix. Um, and those are, those are kind of they're an approach. It's not ideal, but um, it's better to have a humanist declaration in the sample list than not to have one. So that's kind of where I'll leave the talk. I did want to quickly just run through some of the, the, the research um, that's flowing from this talk, because we have this huge data set. So as I mentioned, the data set is publicly available. You're all welcome to use it if you want to run your own analysis. Um, if you notice any errors, please let me know. We, we've gone through it as closely as possible. Um, at the moment, we've got a couple of reports forthcoming. So as I mentioned earlier, we have a report on indigenous content. So we took the indigenous content section out, added a lot more discussion around um, how you would go about with the territorial acknowledgements and the history of indigenous exclusion from the legislature. Um, and that's our forthcoming report from the BC Humanists. Um, the second report is um, one called Arbiters of Faith, which really explores the question of whether the House can actually ask the public to submit sample prayers. They're doing that. We think it's unconstitutional and hugely problematic. Um, and so that's, that's another report. That's currently under peer review at a journal. Um, and then we have another article under review, which is a, a more succinct summary of this report um, in, the Canadian, uh, in another Canadian journal. And then, as I mentioned, um, another forthcoming report is looking at legislative prayer in BC municipalities. That research is done. It's sitting on my desk and needs to be written up. Um, and that explored the question of um, how compliant are BC municipalities with legislative prayer. And um, what we found was they're not totally compliant. There's still some outliers. And that's part of an ongoing project just to ensure compliance with Saguenay. Having court decisions like Saguenay is important only if those decisions are enforced and practiced. Um, and so it's important that we, we follow through and make sure that, that municipalities and governments are complying with them. And I'm punching in the, um, the link again in the chat here for the next step of the project, which is expanding that study of municipalities to the entire country. As I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, uh, and in response to a question, there are 3,700 municipalities across the country. Um, our goal is to not look at all of them, because that's, that's very ambitious, but to look at the top 50 by population for each province and to see if those municipalities are starting with prayer. Um, and then the research that will flow out of that will likely be province by province reports, as well as uh, very firm letters to those municipalities. Um, and we'll be following up. One thing we noticed when looking at municipalities was that they tend to only use prayer at inaugural meetings to add additional you know, pomp and circumstance and ceremony. Um, and so we will be sending letters to municipalities that are not compliant, and then just checking to see if they change their behavior at the next inaugural meeting I mean, if they still don't, then there would be um, additional steps would likely have to be taken.
So if you're interested, you can sign up to volunteer. Um, it's not too much work and it involves looking over municipal websites um, and the data set is going to be really valuable to help push for separation of religion and government in Canada. So with that, I'll leave it. Thank you all very much for, for hearing me out. This was a nice, very long talk and I really appreciate the questions that people asked. And, um, and again, do please see the full report. There we go. Yeah. Um, do please see the full report. And I'm still open to more questions. So if anyone has any other questions they want to share um, or ask, um, I'm, I'm here for them. And thank you all very much. You. I would like to thank you on behalf of uh, Center for Inquiry Canada uh, for this talk. And uh, for uh, we also would like to thank you to BC Humanists uh, for uh, this um, report uh, and the big initiative. And I believe you are the first speaker uh, to call a prayer, even though it's a humanist prayer on a CFIC event. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> like the first, I, ho I hope I wasn't the first to like, do, I mean, we've done Bible study here already. We've been, you know, I think I've said washed in the blood at least six times. So. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>